Go. What? I love you. Okay. Go. I love you. Oh my god. <laughs> Hey everyone and welcome back from your various holidays. Ian and I just got back from Maryland visiting our family during Christmas and the drive back was kind of horrible. Um, usually it takes about eight and a half hours and we were stuck in two hours of traffic in Connecticut and then near Boston and it was not great, especially when you just want to get home. But anyway, um, during our visit to Maryland, where we're both from, we kind of just crammed our schedules with every possible place that we love and needed to see. So we definitely made time to go to one of the cafes that we used to eat at together when we were in high school. We'd also meet up a lot there um, during breaks in college and we went there, got our favorite bagel sandwiches, some coffee, just hung out and listened to the very 90s, early 2000s playlists they had going. Um, we also made time to, of course, stop by the local indie bookstore. Um, we perused a little bit and I definitely bought books. I bought two books from the indie bookstore because I had my $10 off <laughs> as a frequent customer. Um, I went to my favorite Japanese restaurant with my dad on Christmas Eve and had some ramen, enjoyed myself. Um, I also made time to go to one of my favorite, favorite coffee and bike shops. Um, I went there Twice got some coffee beans to bring back here with us to New Hampshire, but I absolutely love that place. They have fantastic pour over coffee and they also sell bikes and different gear and accessories for people who hike and climb and the vibe is immaculate. <laughs> um, what else do we do? Of course, my friend Maria and I, um, we're big plant people, as you can see probably in the corner of this uh, video. One of my plants is absolutely giant and constantly there, and I just did not feel like correcting the ankle. But anyway, we went to one of our favorite nurseries um, and just looked around to see what kind of plants they had on offer. Didn't buy anything, although I really wanted to. But yeah, um, Christmas was active as usual. We had a big dinner with Ian's dad. We opened presents at his mom's house, my mom's house, my dad's house. <laughs> we have a lot of family members to um, visit. We also spent time with our nephew. He is only about, what is he, like five months old now? And it was really nice being able to see him and, of course, his parents, Ian's brother, and his sister in law. But yeah, so I definitely didn't get a lot of reading done during the holiday because everything was just jump and go. We were constantly doing something, whether trying to get to our favorite spots or meeting up with family members and friends in town. But um, yeah, so I thought I'd just give you a little recap um, of you know how our... Christmas in Maryland went down, and now I kind of wanted to talk about my favorite fiction and nonfiction of 2022. I recently made a post of my top three fiction and top three nonfiction, but I also want to mention here um, like two other titles. So, starting with fiction, the first book I want to talk about and just a note, none of these are in chronological order. These are just all books I liked. But the first one I want to talk about, I mentioned in my Lost to the Archives video that I did a few months ago. And that book is The Shame by McKenna Goodman. You can watch that video for a fuller analysis, synopsis of the book. But I really enjoyed the tone of this. I loved the look into the influence of social media, the inherent shame of 
being a woman and having to embody so many roles that are inflicted upon women um, by, you know, like Instagram and commercialism and just all the standards that women are beholden to. And I also kind of liked the somewhat um, uncomfortable elements of the main protagonist essentially stalking a woman that she is um, idolizing through Instagram. She, this woman that she's idolizing is the epitome of what she wants to be as a mother and as a successful artist. I love how McKenna Goodman really just breaks down the source of insecurity for a lot of women who have led fulfilling careers and have had to end them for the sake of um, children, their husbands, and it's something that they've wanted, but they are now enduring the consequences of being basically just cocooned in this one singular role um, of mother. But I, I think the writing is very succinct. As I said, I love the tone of it, I love the pacing of it, and I highly recommend to anyone who's attracted to books about identity, about feminism, um, this one is definitely for you. Also read earlier this year is Be Here to Love Me at the End of the World um, by Sasha Cohen. I was actually surprised because, as you know, I don't typically read books by male authors, but in this case I did and I was pleasantly surprised. I think that this book is just very unique in its structure and how it's written, um, the way that the author approaches a certain topic, and in this instance Sasha Cohen is talking about the mundanity of day-to-day -day life during the impending apocalypse. The environmental repercussions that are right at our doorsteps, um, it's an incredibly comical interpretation of how silly we are right now when, you know, water levels are rising, temperatures are rising, and, you know, resources are dwindling, and all of these things that are huge, you know, and indicative of, you know, an end to not just like the society that we live in, but the world. <laughs> um, and how silly it is that we are, you know, still maintaining nine to fives. And I just love the contrast between something so dark and, um, huge um as you know the earth perishing um next to something so little as like a couple trying to figure out what they want to make for dinner and the style of writing is very quirky i will post a passage here so you can get an idea of how sasha cohen writes how kind of meandering it is and um, charming. I certainly love this book. It was a surprise for me and I really appreciated it. And the next fiction that I really loved in 2022 is The Scapegoat by Karen Balin. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. But this was kind of abstract. <laughs> um, it was like a s experimental novel where the author really gets into family trauma, the effects of that. Basically, the emotional turmoil that our parents can inflict on us with the most passive-aggressive gestures in our childhood. Um, Karen points out that what inspired this novel and what was used as a catalyst for writing this was a stack of letters that she has kept over the years that her father sent her when she was younger and these were very subtly aggressive notes essentially guilt tripping her into being a better daughter a more affectionate daughter that he wanted and 
he sends these letters again as an adult, so opening any wounds that she had, and she turns this into a novel where the protagonist, like her, receives these bitter uh, letters from her father, and this launches this desire to escape her life, and so she goes to New England and works on a farm um, with Nazi cows that sit on your chest, <laughs> and um, she ends up becoming the center for uh, an art exhibit, and the letters that her father wrote become part of an art exhibit, and essentially people are witnessing these words written by her father and seeing them as benign and not hurtful, but for her personally they're very scarring, and I think it's an interesting book that analyzes how pain and you know the internalization of subtle emotional abuse um, really the perception of it varies person to person of course what hurts one person might not affect the other but um, in parallel to this topic that she writes about is the personification of the author slash the protagonist's um, chronic illness. She has rheumatoid arthritis and her she has named her two swollen rheumatic feet after characters in shit. They speak to each other and they tell the protagonist when you know they can no longer move or whatever and I thought this was uh, funny, but also an adept way of expressing the disconnect between your body when you're in such pain and how kind of separating yourself from that physical feeling and you know bringing your mentality away from it helps you cope in some way. But um, I thought this was a completely bizarre book and. I can't claim to have understood all of it, but I don't think ex that's exactly the point. I think just the effectiveness of the narrative and what I gleaned from it, from the bits that I could understand, made it a book that was highly enjoyable for me. The next fiction book that I want to talk about is Love and Other Thought Experiments by Sophie Ward. The structure of this book was based on different philosophical experiments or um, modes of thought and what connected all of these stories was the central two characters, um, a married couple and their son and then the additional friendships that live outside of this main um, set of characters. And what starts the book is one woman and the married couple starts to feel paranoid that there's an ant that has crawled into her brain and the her wife starts to worry that her wife is crazy she doesn't believe that this ant exists in her brain and she tries to talk her out of it and essentially the wife who is under the impression that there's an ant in her brain um knows that her partner is doubting her sanity and knows that she doesn't truly believe her and knows that this is ultimately harming the relationship. The story isn't linear because it is broken into sections of experimental philosophizing and um, despite the fact that it is sort of not clinical but um, I mean, it is big, big and brainy. Um, despite that fact, there is a real heart to this story that um, really beats and expresses familial love and um, the bonds that we build and nurture and how these emotions and these memories together span time and space. Um, and one part of the book, literally, um, I certainly have never read anything that has taken this structure, so I think a common theme with the books that I'm talking about is that 
they are all unique. They're doing something different with language. They're doing something different with form. I really appreciated that. I really appreciated being exposed to new types of writing. And even though the mood um, across the board was quite similar, very contemplative, reflective, I think the way that each story was crafted is incredibly nuanced. So the first nonfiction book that I want to talk about is Vanishing Twins by Leah Dietrich. I thought that this was a refreshing and unique take on the myriad ways that a marriage can be lived. I think Leah Dietrich has a gentle way of writing about sexual identity and about the boundless existence of love, how we can love and desire more than one person at the same time. Vanishing Twins is incredibly unique. Um, I think it also speaks to someone who also identifies as bisexual. I think it was quite comforting to read a book about a married couple who was open to having each person really explore and express their sexual desires and their emotional wants. And I also am really happy that I have been introduced to Leah Dietrich as a person, as a performing artist. She has background in dance and I love following her Instagram and seeing her express herself through multiple different types of media, obviously through writing, but also through her photography and her choreography. And yeah, I'm definitely willing to read anything else that she publishes because I had such a great time with this book. The next nonfiction book that I want to talk about is Abby Palmer's Sanatorium. And this, I was so excited to read after Hannah May. It sounds like I only watch three channels because I always mention them, but I really love these channels. But um, I was really excited to read this one. And this is a collection of brief essays that are about Abby Palmer's experience in the Roman baths as a alternative method of uh, pain relief. She was diagnosed with Crohn's disease and has a lot of ligament pain and joint pain and she received a grant in order to use the Roman baths and swim and um, complete these exercises to alleviate the pain that she was experiencing and she writes about the release that she gets from being in water and how eye-opening this experience was um, and she recognizes her privilege and being able to access a treatment like this which is not readily available to just anyone and when she returns home to London she tries to recreate the space and she tries to use water to her advantage and her flats um, to obviously not the same degree of success but mixed in among these brief essays are Roman art pieces um, that are parallel to her body and what it's experiencing um, in the midst of pain, in the midst of healing. And I think that Abby Palmer managed to write about a personal topic, um, write about her own health um, and do it in a way that was intelligent and funny and occasionally weird and I would definitely actually reread this. It was a short read but um, effective. The next nonfiction I want to talk about is Did You Hear Mammy Died by Seamus O'Reilly and I had seen the hardcover of this at the bookstore in the neighborhood and I really 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 wanted to get it but I was waiting around to see if it was available at the library and eventually it was so I read this on my Kindle and it was one of those books where you're laughing and crying at the same time because I think it's very typical um, Irish writing style to kind of mask in a way the emotional aspect of one's life in a humorous, sarcastic tone and Seamus O'Reilly definitely does this. He also mentions the fact that this is a memoir about him growing up with a huge household. I think he has 
10 siblings and he was only about six years old when his mother died of cancer. And he makes a point to mention that he feels that he was too young to really understand the impact of his mother's loss. He feels sometimes that he's almost a fraud in writing about grief because he didn't think that he was, you know, as old as his older siblings who could really feel the impact of it and really understand what was happening. But I think what we get really is a family saga. We get um, an essence we get the essence of what his mother left behind, which she helped her raise, and the legacy of her love and her affection for her children. You know, he writes about how she was truly born to be a mother, how she was always patient, and how she and her father were very obviously very romantically attracted to each other. They had a strong marriage throughout, and not only is this book about his mother, but it's also very much a love letter to his father for you know, being a single man, raising 11 children on his own, balancing different plays and sports matches and driving everyone around in their giant camper van. And I thought this memoir was very heartfelt and funny and quintessentially Irish. He talks about the visiting priests, Catholicism, and the general rule of handing out cups of tea in times of grief. Um... Yeah, he somehow manages to make his mother's wake into a routine comedy. And I really loved it. I really loved his writing style. And I think that it was a great laugh and a great cry. And the last nonfiction book that I want to talk about that I read in 2022 is In Ordinary Time by Carmel McMullen. And this was a digital arc that I received from Duckworth Books. This comes out in spring of 2023. And I was absolutely hit over the head with this book. And yes, it is another Irish memoir. And I think that Carmel, she writes about generational trauma. She writes about Irish history and how can we escape the scars of our ancestors. And she writes a lot about alcoholism, her own battle with it, her family's battle with it. She talks about um, the Irish famine. She talks about how, you know, there's such a great loss and there's such a great hunger in Irish history that seems to transcend generations. And she's wondering in this book how it's even possible to live beyond that when it's so ingrained in the Irish identity. She writes a book that is both personal with her own family history, but also incredibly political. She talks about the impact of political leaders and their decisions on people's consciousness. You know, communities are affected by politicians' decisions when they use humans as pawns in a game. And I think that this memoir is incredibly astute. Um, Again, very personal, but also angry. And I really love reading a book that is angry at its core, especially when it's written by a woman because, you know, she is hitting different topics from all sides and she manages to do it beautifully. Plus, she is very open and very kind on Instagram. Um, uh, We follow each other now. And I am very happy that I read this book and I can't wait to see what else she has to write. So those were my favorite titles of 2022. I am kind of brewing some books in my head, some titles in my head that I want to get to in the new year, but I'm trying not to overwhelm myself. I haven't really set a reading goal for the next year because sometimes that kind of just turns me off, but um, I am currently reading a digital arc from FSG, and that is Close to Home by Michael McGee. Clearly, there's a theme here. I love Irish literature. This is a piece of fiction, though it's heavily based on the author's own experience um, growing up in Dublin. But yeah, I'm currently reading that, and I think that I will end up picking up a paperback. Um, it maybe one of the ones that I bought when I was back home in Frederick. I hope that you all had a fruitful reading year, and I hope that you're looking forward to the next. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe. I post every Wednesday and Saturday, and... I will see you in the next bookish video.
Bye.